Cheers, Tom. Can you listen to your computer? Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks, Tom. Ryan. Uh, yep. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome in. Thank you for being on this call and joining this special program presented by Florida Blue and in partnership with the Florida Youth Soccer Association. My name is Ryan Sudall, getting ready to go into my 10th season as your stadium announcer at Al Lang for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Uh, just a fun reminder, fans, you will have a chance to win an autographed Rowdies kit and tickets to a future Rowdies match if you text Florida Blue 3, so Florida Blue and the number 3, to 833-222. 2174 while we're doing this lunch and learn event. Again, be sure to text Florida Blue 3 to 833 222 2174 for your chance to win. Uh, we'll also add the information to the chat box for everyone to view. So if you have any questions, also for Neil during the call, you can type them in the chat box. We will uh, get to them at the conclusion. Uh, Neil will answer some of the questions for you. But before we get started, here is a brief message from our partners at Florida Blue. Getting back to all of this will take all of us. If you have questions about the vaccines, Florida Blue nurses are standing by for your call. Florida Blue, your local Blue Cross Blue Shield, here for the one place we call home. Well, if there's one thing that we've learned from COVID-19, it's that it doesn't matter how healthy we feel. We never know when an unexpected medical issue may sideline us. Uh, it could be an injury while playing soccer with friends or a major illness like COVID-19. Fixing a broken leg can cost up to $7,500, and the average hospitalization for a COVID patient is $73,000. Uh, the COVID relief bill recently signed into law not only provides us stimulus checks, but it also gives us big discounts on health insurance to make sure we're protected from unexpected medical bills. If you don't get health insurance through your job, there's a good chance you can get financial assistance to get a plan through the Affordable Care Act. With the new COVID relief law, three out of four people can find a health plan that costs them $10 or less per month. Plus, the new law gives financial assistance to more than 300,000 Floridians who were previously told they make too much money to qualify. Nine out of 10 people now qualify for help paying for health insurance, myself included. Uh, so even if you've already got an ACA plan, you may be able to lower the price or upgrade to a better plan. Call a Florida Blue agent to find out more. For more details, you can visit floridablue.com slash enroll to talk to someone about what financial assistance you may qualify for and what low price plans are now available to you and your family because of the COVID relief bill. The government has reopened the enrollment until August 15th, so you can take advantage of these new savings. So don't miss out. Protect you and your family now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we would also like to recognize our partners at the FYSA, the Florida Youth Soccer Association. The Tampa Bay Rowdies have entered into a two-year partnership with FYSA, and we'll be working together through various initiatives such as workshops, coaching classes, apprentice programs, and esports. And for coaches and parents of youth soccer players on today's call, there is a special opportunity for your kids to train where the Rowdies train this summer at Al Lang in an open to the Florida Youth Soccer Association recreational and competitive programs uh, for training sessions. And for info and registration, just contact Rowdies Youth at RowdiesSoccer.com. Again, that is to sign up for the uh, training at Al Lang. We will add all of the information in the chat box located on your screen. So please reach out to the Rowdies Youth team for more details. And last but not least, a special thank you to Joel Dragon, at FYSA Executive Director, and Kai Velmer, the FYSA President, for the tremendous support. 
Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our head coach, Neil Collins, to discuss his pathway from playing professional soccer and transitioning to head coach. Neil, take it away. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, just give me two seconds. I'm dealing with a few technical issues. I'm going to try now and share my screen um, before we get started. So wish me luck on this. Ryan, nod your head. Is that up there? Good man. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for for joining for joining us. Um, I'm not going to uh, give you any, uh, you know, magical magical words of wisdom, um, but I'm going to take you through a little bit about you know my career and uh, particularly my transitioning from from player to coach. Uh, please feel free. To, to ask any questions um, at all. I think that's the best way for, for us all to get the most out of this is, is for me to be able to respond to your questions. So feel free to put them in the chat box and um, at, the end, at the end, I'll try and deal with them. Now I'm having technical issues. I'm going to need my helper, Jake, nothing to come back, I'm afraid. There we go. All right, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my my playing career uh, because obviously that's been a big part of big part of my life, and uh, it's what's taken me into into coaching. Um, like, like every young sportsman, you have to start somewhere. And I, and I started at my local, my local team, uh, which, was, which was ran by my, my dad. Um, a lot of people get coached by their parents and um, can have varying levels of success. I was very fortunate to have a very, very supportive and on top of that knowledgeable um, parent who was able to certainly push me at the right times, but also you know, support me. And that's where I look back with some of my fondest memories, you know, of the game. And, and I think um, it's so important that people in grassroots sports appreciate, you know, the platform that they're given, you know, children. And they're, they're the coaches that they'll remember for the rest of their life if, if you have that positive impact on them. Equally, it can be, it can be a negative impact. You can turn people away from the game you know, if, if you don't um, do the right thing. So I think I look back with great memories and um, I think grassroots coaches are you know, they're vital to keep continue growing the game, especially in this country, as the game gets better and bigger. I um, then went from Trim Thistle Boys Club to Queen's Park, who are the oldest club in, um, in Scotland. Um, founders of the game and a very, very um, rich history, especially of producing young players and giving them a pathway. This uh, certainly wasn't the biggest club in Scotland, um, but it was a club at the time of 15 years old that was able to give me the opportunity to, to progress and, and actually play against senior professional players, men at the age of 17 while it's still at high school. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't good enough to be part of one of the professional academies but what Queen's Park was able to do was to give me, you know, the opportunity as a young player, a 17, 18 year old to play against, you know, men. And I think that's something that was vital in my development as opposed to playing against players my age, which I'd already experienced all the way growing up. I was now starting to really accelerate my development by playing, by playing first team football, um, a semi-professional level. And then I um, was able to, to improve relatively quickly, as I say, with that, that accelerated development, playing all those games. And then uh, I, I went up a level um, to Dumbarton, where I spent two years. And this was, again, hugely influential um, in, my, in my improvement as an 18, 19 year old. And at this point in time, I started attracting interest from bigger clubs in Scotland and, and, and professional clubs in England. 
which meant uh, trial periods. Um, the club received a couple of offers to to buy to buy me, um, and you know again a great great part of my development playing alongside players that had distinguished careers, who are always a great help to me. But then ultimately just being in that professional environment, playing against professional players, it was. Um, it was, you know, absolutely valuable. And, and over that period with Dumbarton and Queen's Park, I was able to to make somewhere over 100 professional appearances by the age of 20. And to try and put that in some context, I think you you look at maybe the equivalent of a counterpart in um, the United States, and that, that, that player maybe has just got into their, their second year at college. You know, so... I think that's one thing in the UK that you get exposed to, you know, senior professional football, you know, much quicker. And, and without that, I don't think I would have known to have a, a career. Um, I then made a huge jump from Dumbarton to um, Sunderland, who were at that time were in the in the second tier of English football below the English Premier League. Um, famous manager who's still going to this day. He's managed uh, Ireland at the World Cup. Managed many Premier League teams. Mike McCarthy gave me an opportunity, and um, going as a full-time professional at the age of 20 was, you know, what I dreamed of since playing for Trent Thistle. And um, you know, that opportunity, as I say, was was one that I didn't expect, but managed to take. And in my first season there, we we gained promotion to the English Premier League, which is the pinnacle um, pinnacle in terms of club football um, I, after after my time at Sunderland I then moved around over a few clubs I played for uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers where again with the same manager Mick McCarthy took me there and we won a promotion to the English Premier League again um, and then I played for Leeds who are flying high right now in the English Premier League and then spent a good five years at Sheffield United who are also right now in the English Premier League uh, although on their way out uh, unfortunately after uh, 12 years in England playing for various different clubs I then um, made the decision to you know take part of my career or the last part of my career to the, the United States um, and that was to play with the Tampa Bay Rowdies where I ultimately finished my career um, at the age of at the age of 34 so again there's too many clubs to fit on one slide but that's the the main clubs that I played for, and I think that takes me on to to the next the next part of my journey, which is my coaching. Um, here just again to just prove that I did play, um, and I've not made it up. Some some photos, um, of my time at some of those clubs. You'll see there in the bottom right, um, that's me and uh, Harry Maguire. Uh, Harry Maguire right now is the captain of Manchester United, and plays for England. He's the world's most expensive defender. I was uh, I played beside Harry 150 times at Sheffield United, and um, I'm going to take all the credit for his future success. There's just uh, some of the statistics, uh, and probably one of the things that I'm most proud of in my playing career is almost 600 appearances. Um, I think the one thing that for me the appearance record uh, proves is one the longevity, and. 598 times a, a coach has decided to put me on the field in a professional game. You know, I think they might get that wrong once or twice, but over over a career to be picked that many times, um, you know, I think shows the dedica dedication that it takes to to stay fit, to stay healthy, to stay ready and available. And then I had to put in there that I did score some goals now and again, even though I was a centre back. So now on to my my coaching career, and um, to be honest, it goes hand in hand with my playing my playing career, and it started all the way back um, when I actually left school and I went to university. As I mentioned, I wasn't quite good enough at the ages of 15, 16, where, where players in the UK get picked to to go in as um, as young professionals. So I had to prepare not only for career in football, that's what I wanted, but I also had to prepare for a career potentially outside of football, not as a player, because I wasn't sure if I was going to be good enough as much as that was my desire. So I, I took on a, a course at the University of Strathclyde. It was um, coach education. 
and um, balance that with playing. So definitely, if I hadn't been good enough, I was already thinking along the lines of, of being a coach. It would certainly have been a different level to start with, but I was I was certainly ready for that. I started my badges at that age. I started my e-licence at the age of 17 before going to university and then continued uh, earning those those coaching licences all through all through my career because one thing about being a professional sportsman is it's a short career and while some people are fortunate enough to earn a lot, earn so much money that they, they're able to retire regardless of whether that's possible you know it's um you're still a very young person and I was always very very keen to then pursue a pursue a coaching career afterwards and, and and taking those badges was vital in preparing for that as I came then to the states um, and I was and I was coming to the end of my career. I was really starting to put a focus on what might be next. You know, you're never sure when um, the phone doesn't ring and, and the club don't want you to extend that contract. So I started my own coaching business, which was very much focused on grassroots. You know, um, local kids in the area. I had six, seven, eight-year-olds uh, coming to train, and I think that was part of my own coach education. But also took great enjoyment. And, and been able to to help you know young players in the in the local area. Um, I then got a great opportunity with with someone that I met. Um, he's part of the the FYSA. As some of you on here might know him, Jim Hart. He actually came to a, a game with his team at Ao Lang and um, got to meet him. And three or four months later, he invited me to be a assistant coach at Carrollwood Day School. You know, and again, um, I was extremely eager to learn in any avenue I possibly could. You know, despite having played at a high level, I was under no illusions that to go into coaching, I was starting again. And that period at the school uh, was was fantastic. You know, working with a fantastic coach in person and gym, but also working with these high school kids that had had a great appetite for learning and getting better. So that that was really you know, great um, experience for myself. And then I was invited along to, to coach with the US Paralympic men's team. Again, a fantastic opportunity for me to, you know, just get out there. And I think that's one of the biggest things about my early coaching experience was just any opportunity to get out and coach anyone at any level was a great learning curve. And then, and then finally, um, getting offered that chance to be a head coach at the USL championship level uh, was was one that I was willing to sacrifice my my playing career for. Um, as I showed you, 598 appearances. One of my goals was to get to 600. Um, but when an opportunity to to coach the Rowdies comes up, you know it was it was too good to turn to turn down. I've I've focused I've focused a lot on obviously my 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 playing career, the start of my coaching career, and I know there's maybe people on this call that are. Are not necessarily sports people, um, but I think the principles of achieving a career in anything um, to a high level are the same. And I'm going to kind of go through the three key principles I think to having, you know, a successful career and to, to trying to achieve to achieve that. Um, the first being find something that you're passionate about. Um, there's a great saying that, you know, find something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I'm not quite sure that's entirely true because I think even as much as I love football, there's days there's days that are tougher than others, but I think the principle applies. If there's something that you can be passionate about, something that motivates you, inspires you, something that, you, that gets you excited, um, doesn't necessarily need to be something that you love, but something that gets you excited, I think that's definitely something that you want to try and pursue. From an early age, I was in love with football, um, had a real passion for it, whether it be watching it, talking about it, playing it. Um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Ultimately, I wanted to be a player and I put all my focus into that. But I also had a great passion for, for coaching it, just being involved in it. And um, I think when you have that, when you have your, your harder days, it's much, much easier to motivate yourself um, to, to carry on. So anyone that's looking to pursue a career, you know, in something, I think it has to be underpinned by that, that great motivation to do it. So um, 
I think that's one of the reasons why I, I enjoyed my playing career so much um, and I'm enjoying my coaching career so much because I've got a great passion for football and being part of it in any in any way, shape or form. Next, next is definitely having an aptitude for something uh, coupled with the passion. I think we're all passionate about many things, but maybe not got the ability uh, to go along with it. I mean, for example, I love listening to music, um, but the thought of going on stage and actually being able to sing a song is something from an early age people told me I would never have the gift to do. So quite quickly, uh, I forgot a, mu a music career for for something um, that I was much better at. I think um, in any walk of life, no matter what it is you're doing, whether, whether it's sport, art, um, business, there's always ways to measure whether or not you've got that aptitude. I'm very fortunate in, in, in football, soccer, that you know you get picked for the team. You get picked for the team. Does your team do well? How do you perform? Um, and it doesn't mean that you're always fantastic, but you certainly need to have a certain level of ability. And um, that's that's there then fueled by your passion to really start in, in improving. And um, I think that's what you, you should all, everyone should be looking for when they're trying to think about, do they have a real passion for what they're doing? And then do they have, do they have an ability to, to improve and really become one of the top in their field at it? And then, and finally, to really then sustain that and take that on and, as I say, make that a career over a number of years. There's many people that have the passion and they have the ability, but how many people let themselves down then with a the perseverance? I think we all went to school and I've known people that had a great passion for a sport, great passion for something and had the ability. But then at the first sign of, at the first sign of trouble, you know, we're willing to give up. Um, I think the, the great thing about people that are successful at any level or any walk of life is at some point or another they had to show, you know, perseverance. Um, whether it be in, in, in the sporting world, it's, um, you know, injury, uh, not being selected, uh, you know, all the, all the things that you can imagine that you have to deal with. Um, and how, and how you managed to do that. And I, I can recommend right now a fantastic book that someone gave to me recently, Angela Duckworth, and it's called Grit. And it's really, she goes into great detail about how that separates people from a young age. You know, the children that are willing to, you know, if they've signed up for ballet class and after two sessions, they don't just give up. You know, and I think instilling that in people from a young age uh, then goes on to serve them later in life. Um, and I can tell you throughout my long playing career and my short coaching career, there's times that you have to show that perseverance, no matter how good or how passionate you are about it. So those are the three things I just wanted to highlight for anyone that's um, trying to pursue, you know, a career. So I think um, it's important to spend just few minutes talking about that transition from from playing to coach some people uh, know some people might not know but that transi transition happened to me literally overnight I um, played for the Tampa Bay Rowdies on a Wednesday night in the Open Cup and by the, the Thursday night the following evening I was the head coach and um, I was very very fortunate to get that opportunity and I'll go I'll go into uh, that a little bit more detail later but um, it wasn't certainly the the original way to become a head coach I think it's it's much more common for people to go through a much longer apprenticeship um, assistant coach you know coaching at different levels before you work, work your way up to that level but I think it's important as you've seen when I when I talked about while I was playing I was constantly trying to put myself um, into the best possible position to be ready for opportunity. And I think that's that's one of the biggest things I learned was that constantly trying to, to position yourself where you've done your UEFA A license, you've done your UEFA B license, you've, you've been in the community, you've got yourself experience so that when the opportunity comes up, 
you feel that you're ready to take it. I would have been devastated had Mr. Edwards think, thought I was the right man to be head coach, but I didn't have my coaching qualifications and that opportunity could have passed me by. So that's something that I'm very grateful that one, I had the initiative to do, but also the support from my family, my wife to, to go and pursue them while, while I was playing. Um, again, taking on a head coach's role when you're so inexperienced rightly raises a lot of questions. Um, I don't think there's ever uh, necessarily a right time to step up. I've known plenty of people that have coached for many years and then struggled when they take the head coaching job. And I think the biggest thing for me um, was been, has been able to learn, learn on the job, you know, use all the experience I've got, but then been able to learn by being in the job. And that's one thing I would say to anyone that's, that's trying to make a decision on when to make that step up. You know, for me, the best way to learn as I, as I felt in my playing career was as well, was being out there um, in the arena, you know, uh, learning on the job. So I wanted to share uh, some of the best advice I've got since I took the job. It was actually from, you know, our president of the Rowdies organization, Lee Cohen. Um, early on in the job, he just quite simply told me, you know, to be myself. I think um, it's great. We live in a world now where we can learn so much whatever field you're in through social media, through the internet about how people do certain things. But I think your journey and your uh, personality and character is very unique to yourself. Your learning experiences that you've been through and the way you want to do things are the reason that you're in that position. And that's what I've tried to do. I've learned a lot from the different coaches and people that I've worked with all my life. And I'll try to use, you know, the good things and learn from the negative things. But ultimately, I've got to be myself. And that's why Mr. Edwards and the Rays and, and, and Lee Cohen have, have given me this opportunity is because they see something in me. So I would only be doing them a disservice if I was then to um, go and try and be someone else. So that was certainly something that really helped me and, and certainly gave me courage and my conviction, you know, over the past two years to, to make the decisions that I feel are the, are the right ones. I wanted to share um, this photo last year. Um, the team were able to win the Eastern Conference Championship. We were un unable to to play the the, the, the final, the, the USL final, um, due to COVID. But that was a fantastic success for the club, their first trophy in eight years. Um, but I think um, when people see success like that, they sometimes forget or don't don't look maybe what, what brings that success. Um, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Um, and I just wanted to go through a few of the key points that I think got this club into that position. And again, it all, start, it all started for me um, getting the, the job with, with Mr. Edwards and was being able to present Mr. Edwards of my vision of where I felt the Tampa Bay Rowdies could be and where I think I could take them and been able to um, convey that vision in a way that, that he felt that I was the right man to then implement it. And I was very fortunate that, that one, Mr. Edwards gave me that chance, but then the Tampa Bay Rays have come in and supported me and, and also bought into the, the vision that I've had. So I think what, whatever you're doing, um, again, whether it's sport or otherwise, you want to have a clear vision of what of what that looks like. If it's in business, what does your business look like? What does it feel like? Um, and you want to be able to convey that to people to get them to buy into that. It's not so much a goal. I mean, I think everyone wants to see that picture of their team holding the trophy, but what does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and I think that's something that you have to, as I say, be able to convey that message. I think just under that, there then certainly have to be clearly defined goals. And that was, um, again, always the championship. Our players, when you ask them what's our goals this season, they always say it's the championship. I think every team, every business say, says the same. They want to be the best. I think it's important then that you can narrow that down into much more clearly defined goals. And we've we've done that a lot over the last two years. Um, 
it started out quite simply with one of our goals was to be better on the road. You know, you can't be successful if you don't win on the road and constantly breaking it down into smaller. How are we going to be better on the road at winning games? And then constantly drilling it down into the finer details. And it's amazing when you start getting the smaller details right, how the bigger ones come on top of that. Um, last year, we really wanted to focus on going on the road and winning and winning against the big teams, winning in Louisville, winning in New York, winning, winning in Miami, places we'd never done that before. I thought that would be a sure sign that we're getting closer to the vision of making the Tampa Bay Rowdies the best team in the USL. Um, and then again this year, we've got goals that we'll set ourselves um, behind the scenes that all eventually will culminate and hopefully us you know, being the best team in the league. Once we've narrowed those goals down, a big part of my job is then to put the processes in place and how we're going to achieve them. And um, again, the processes are not limited to sport. It's, it's part of business, it's part of life. You know, what's the process to get and achieving your goals? And and in, and in football, there's, there's so um, many dimensions to that. You know, how do we scout better players? How do we train better? How do we work with our staff better? Um, how do we engage with our fans? You know, and then there's all the details around that. And, and over time, we've, um, we've built these processes. And that was one of the, the biggest things as a young coach. I had many ideas that I wanted to put in place and, and having the time to do that is important. You know, you can't put these things in over again overnight. It takes time to build a process and that's always going to evolve. All of this is only and then possible with the, with the right people. Um, again, speaking for our organisation, you know, it starts with the staff. One thing I felt coming to the Tampa Bay Rowdies as a player was the fantastic people we had behind the scenes, the people that were willing to go the extra mile, the people that wanted to uh, support the players and everything they do. They wanted the club to be successful. I felt as a player that wasn't always reciprocated uh, by the work ethic of the, the playing staff and the, and the coaching staff. And that's something that we'll really work to try and get up to the same standard as behind the scenes. And, and I think slowly we've done that by getting in the right people, the right type of characters, um, to represent the club well, the right kind of staff that represent, you know, what our ultimate vision is for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. And then and then once you get into that, get the right people there, it's been able to manage them. You know, we've got a lot of different people from different backgrounds. And um, again, one of my biggest learning experiences has been how to deal with people. You know, when you're, um, again, day-to-day -day working in any walk of life, one thing's for sure, that people are unpredictable. Things come up in life that you don't expect. You know, family members get ill, people make mistakes, people are late. Um, how, how do you deal with that? You know, because again, none of us are perfect um, and life's not perfect. And then again, as a young coach, some of the things that we've had to deal with have been, have been really tough, but also just make you realise how important it is that you're able to manage people. So I think that's something, again, that you want to constantly be thinking about is those soft skills with, with people. And then finally, when you do all that, you have to then be able to reflect and evaluate. We're constantly reflecting and evaluating and being willing to learn and listen, how do we do it better? Um, it's, it's always tough. Players, you know, don't like criticism. And um, I think there's you've got to be willing to have the tough conversations, not only with your staff and your players or your employees, but with yourself. And finding people that can do that is very tough, especially if you're the, you know, you're the boss. But something we, you know, I constantly try to do, and we try to do, is be as honest as we can with ourselves. And um, once you've done that, you go back to reevaluating your goals, your vision, your process, and refine. And, and that's why I've been very, very fortunate as a young coach to have really, really supportive owners that have given me the time to really um, bed all, bed all this down. I think following on from that, I love this. I love this graphic and it, it kind of backs up the photo previously. You know, when you see the person on the podium, you always feel from the outside it's it's that straight, that straight um rise to the top. Where when I look back through my whole journey, it's constantly 
filled with ups, downs and uh, roundabouts. When you feel that, you know, you, you're going two steps back and all of a sudden you take three forward. I think um, we all need to remind ourselves that at times when times are difficult, that, that no one does anything that's worth doing um, if it's not difficult. Um, and really trying to remember remember that during the difficult periods. And it comes back to the perseverance. You've got to constantly persevere. I uh, just wanted to finish before I take some questions with, with again, you know, we, we, we all want to be passionate about something. But then what's behind what's behind that passion? Why why do you then want to go through all that uh, hard work? And I just wanted to share a little bit about what motivates me. Um, my four children, of course. I think uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, a great role model for me growing up was my parents, my dad, coaching my team, the belief and support that he showed, that showed me at times where I thought I would never make it as a professional Um was, was so helpful, but also pushing me at the right time. So I, I want to do the same for my children. And I think one way to do that is to is to be a success in the job that I'm in. So I'm constantly trying to, to show them the right values by doing that. I think my whole family, as I spoke about, my wife, um, my parents. Then um, the, the players, the players and the people that I work with. You know, I think um, we all love, you know, as I say, ho holding a trophy. But one of the greatest intrinsic motivations is, is having an impact on players and people that you're working with by trying to help them, by trying to make them better. I think we all look back at our own lives and think about people that helped us along the way and the, and the regard we hold them with. So that's a big motivation for me. And then again, finally, um, the, just the people that you get to meet and the relationships you get along the way. When people ask me what the highlights of my career were, I always say it's the people that I met. And that's continuing That's continuing to this day. My assistant um, in my photo to my right is someone that I played with, who I'm very lucky to have here to, to continue our kind of relationship, friendship. And then all the other guys in, the, in that photo are people that I've met since I've been here at the Tampa Bay Rowdies that have become friends. Um, and I think that's the greatest thing about doing something again that you love and you're passionate about is you you, you get to meet people, like-minded people that you can build great friendships with. So, um, yep, I hope I feel I've talked for a long time there. So I'm keen to, to hear any questions that you guys might have. So please feel free. I'm sure Ryan will shout them out. Yeah, I've got a few. Thanks, Neil, for that uh, the presentation. The first uh, question, you talked about how uh, back in 2018, you're in, uh, you're in Jacksonville at the Open Cup, and then, you know, the next day you're the head coach. Can you talk about um, just kind of how your relationship um, from being a player to then turning into a coach, how, how you kind of related to your teammates, having you were one of the guys and now you were the guy, just kind of how that relationship changed. And then also, um, how did your preparation uh, for training change from being a player to being a manager? That's a question I've, I've been asked a lot. Um, and I think at times it was such a whirlwind that I didn't have too much time to consider, you know, going from player to coach, just what an impact that really was. I look back now and really appreciate more you know, to go from playing with these guys to being their friend, to being their teammate, to being their boss, and um, was you know was really difficult. Or should have been really difficult, but first of all, the players made it very easy. The players have to take a lot of credit for their maturity, for their professionalism, but just for for making it for making it easy. And then I was so um, excited about the opportunity, but also so determined. So I wasn't going to let that. I was I very quickly went from being a player, being part of a team, to thinking, right, now now my job is effectively to do what's best for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. And I've seen, again, I go back to the staff, I felt that it was time to start improving certain things for the sake of these great people. So when it came to tough decisions, I, was, I wasn't I was um, going to shirk them. I mean, for example, my roommate, uh, York and Graf, great guy, still in touch with him to these days, but I had to, I left him out and that was difficult. And 
then all of a sudden he feels different about me personally, which I totally understand. But again, I try to always be honest, try to speak to people, try and be up front. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm, as I say, I'm comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations because I know I'm trying to do it for the right reasons. And I've got to hope that somewhere down the line, people think I was professional and respectful. Um, you know, whether they like me personally or not, it's sometimes tough. Uh, I have a question for you regarding the uh, youth levels. Uh, specifically, it was about U11 and you. A lot of uh, kind of held under a microscope in America, but the the emphasis on being fast and fit or being technical, what do you feel is uh, more important at those youth levels? Well, Ryan, I mean, one of my pet hates, and I'm out, I'm actually out at these fields a lot because my son is nine and he's part of it, is um, the time spent before the age of 11, 12. I don't know how many coaches are on the call, but I would certainly ask you how many of your players can juggle a ball? How many of your players can clip the ball in the air 20 yards with their left and right foot? If you've got 12, 13 year olds that can't do that, there's been a problem way before that that, that, that needs addressing. Um, and it disappoints me when I see teams that, as I say, their players can't juggle the ball. It's not that they juggle a ball on the field in a game, but it's just it's just developing those techniques. You know, can they control the ball when it comes out of the sky? Have they got a good touch? Have they got a feel for it? So I think, look, the physical elements of the game are vital, but um, they should be trained within the game up to the age of 14, 15. You should be able to get match fit for football by playing football. You know, our players very rarely do run in isolated. Yes, they're at an age where they need to do prehab and um, weights at the right time, but weights that are relative to football. So my biggest advice is when you're coaching kids of any age, it should be football. It should be playing football. You can still work on their speed, their speed of dribbling, their changes of direction, their one-on-one -on -one defending. That's all related to speed. And, you know, again, the fitness side of things, I think that's something that the players should take a real ownership of. You know, when I was at 15, I had to really um, train hard myself to get my fitness levels up to where they should be. Um, and obviously, I need. I was very fortunate to have the support of my parents to push me and guide me in that direction. So as a coach, you might have to guide a player that's maybe not the fittest or not the quickest to improve that aspect. But, you know, they, they need to have the technical aspects and some of the basic technical aspects are, are sorely neglected. Um, so I would I would definitely strongly advise people to be really concentrating on the fundamentals because that is what's going to stand you in good stead for the future. Uh, another question saying uh, several of the, the current rowdies are participating in the USL's coaching courses. Uh, what do you feel the benefits are for players obtaining their coaching credentials? They realize how difficult it is. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I think I'm, I'm, um, I hope they're in a fortunate position where I can relate to these guys and I want to try and have them as best prepared for the end of their careers. Hopefully it's a long time to come. But also I think it just broadens our knowledge of the game. It gives them a different perspective. It helps me because if they're thinking about the game differently, we can, we can speak about it differently. But a big part of it, again, is who's going to be the next of these coaches who's going to be the next row of these assistant coaches is it going to be one of these guys in the future um i want players at this level you know we talk about grassroots as well i want there to be more better grassroots coaches well our players are going to be those next generation of coaches and if they can get they can get their coaching licenses they're going to be better prepared than a lot of people out there and then they've got their experience as well of playing the game so um, we're looking to constantly build what we're doing in the community, constantly build what we're doing with the best players in the area and our players are an important part of that so it says a lot about them that we had seven on the course last year, I mean that's just fantastic Neil, there seems to be a lot of uh, pressure for some parents to get their kids involved in uh, competitive soccer as young as seven or eight years old, uh, when do you feel um is your opinion when kids should get more serious with the sports versus just being out there learning the basics and the fundamentals? What what age do you feel or what life stage do you feel that it's it's good to get into that competitive mindset if that's something uh, a kid feels that they're good enough to go professional? 
Again, it's a really good question, and I think it's a question that is pertinent to this country. Um, in the UK, growing up, there wasn't rec, there wasn't competitive. It was just you played, you played football, you played for a team. Of course, there were some teams that were better than than other teams, but um, you went to you went to training. Um, but we had the added advantage of being able to play with our friends a lot. I think now the biggest restriction on these children are twofold. One, that they're probably overcoached, where everything's a coaching session. You know, three nights a week getting coached. uh, Is that knocking the creativity out of them? Is that giving them the the ability to just play, free play and learn from playing the game? Um, You know, I think that that was definitely... You know, a big thing, a big thing for me, um, and then, you know, again, just this distinction between recreation and, and competitive at such a young age. I mean, trust me, you cannot. No one can pick at eight, nine, ten who's going to be a professional player. Just impossible. If you can do that, you will make an awful lot of money. And you speak to the best in the world at all these academies around the world, and they can't. Um, the great thing about sport is everyone can take a different path. Um, Joe Cole that was here, that played for England, that played for Chelsea, didn't play competitively till 11 years old. But he was playing a lot of football on the streets with his friends. So he was playing it passionately. He was playing it, you know, um, competitively in terms of the games I'm sure that he played on the street were competitive, but he didn't have a coach. Uh, I played for a team, but then at 15 was told I wasn't good enough uh, by professional clubs. But then that was the best thing that happened to me because then it made me get better. Uh, so I would say that every kid's different. Every and it comes back to what I, I highlighted early on. You know they need to what they need to love it. So if, if they love it, you don't need to force them into anything. You've got to try and help them and guide them. But I would say at the age of nine, ten, do they need to be training three nights a week? You know, and then games at weekends because they, you don't want them to lose their childhood. And, and then look back and think, ah, oh, you know, at 15 they're burnt, they're burnt out. So you'll know your, your own, you'll know your own, own children, and um, you've got to think of their siblings. It's, it's, it's tough. I, I wish I could give you a distinct answer, but what I would say is, you know, if you're training twice a week at 10 and not three times a week, that's not going to make or break whether they're going to be a professional in the future. You know, uh, make sure they're enjoying it. Make sure they're practicing on their own. Um, and I think that's 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 the most important. And then the uh, the last question from a, uh, a goalkeeper uh, standpoint, they want to know how you like to work with the goalkeeping coach and do you like to integrate keeper practice in with the squad or just kind of let them do their own thing uh, when you're not going, uh, you know, 11 on 11? Yeah, I mean, if I could send them out the back and away from the rest of the squad, that would be great. But, um, no, I, you know, it's the goalkeeping roles really evolved over the last few years. And our goalkeeping coach is, is the top um, at this level. So I feel trust in him. Um, he, I don't take, I don't need to take too much of an interest in what he does with the keepers because, I, you know, as I say, he's a total professional. But we do integrate them a lot more than we've ever done with the team. Uh, even if it's not necessarily goalkeeping where they're saving shots, we have them using their feet. We have them involved to start having that decision making. So um, that's something that's constantly evolving and we're constantly looking at how we can get the most out of our goalkeepers. So we're very fortunate to have a specialised coach. If we didn't, you know, I would certainly uh, try my best to keep them as integrated as possible. I think nowadays the goalkeeper is a very important part of how you, how you build out and how you want to play. Awesome. Well, that's all we have time for, Neil. We know you have a another call. We want to thank everybody for joining the call here for Florida Blue and the FYSA. For those of you that texted in Florida Blue 3 to the 833 numbers, someone from the front office will uh, get back to you as far as the winners are concerned. And we hope to see everybody out at Al Lang Stadium next Saturday, May 1st, as we open our 2021 campaign against the Charlotte Independents at 7.30 p.m. Again, at Al Lang Stadium. If you can't make it out on May 1st, then make sure you have your ESPN Plus subscription uh, re-upped and catch the rest of the Rowdies in this 2021 uh, defending championship season. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Neil, also for being with us. Thanks, everyone.